Good luck time, everyone. I'm really happy to be here, honored uh, to share with you some thoughts around digital social innovation in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is around 23 million people, and in the past two years and a half, we've managed to counter the pandemic with no lockdowns, and we countered the infodemic, the disinformation crisis, with no takedowns. And what follows is uh, about 15 minutes of slides talking about how we did that with social innovation, and I welcome the Q&A that goes after that. So social innovation, or everyone's business with everyone's help, can be distilled into three pillars that's fast, fair, and fun. The fast pillar contains this idea of collective intelligence. On the last day of 2019 in PTT, which is the civil society equivalent of Reddit in Taiwan, uh, there's a young Dr. No More Pai posted this message from Dr. Li Wenliang from Wuhan saying there's um, a few SARS cases, seven SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market. Unlike in more anti-social corners of other social media platforms, because this platform has no advertisers or shareholders, this is purely for purpose, people very quickly triaged uh, the information, amplified the legitimacy of this whistleblowing, and then we took action the very next day uh, and started health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. But collective intelligence is not just about people who frequent text-based bulletin board systems. Rather, anyone with a phone line, a landline, can call this toll-free number 1922 to add to the collective intelligence. Instead of an answering machine, someone with a lot of empathy receives the phone. And for example, in 2020 April, there was a young boy who called saying, hey, you're rationing out masks, which is great, but all I got was pink ones, which is not great. I don't want to wear pink to school. Well, the very next day on the daily 2 p.m. press conference, Mr. Chen and all the medical officers wore pink. And Mr. Chen even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So for a couple of weeks, all the fashion brands wore pink until they wore uh, rainbow a few months afterward. Uh, and then masks become something of a self-expression instead of a top-down order, again, that adopted um, the mask rationing and all the mask use uh, became much increased with this fashion self-expression based fast collective intelligence. Now, the rationing system that we adopted for mask and for rapid test and so on is again based on the idea of open data. We update in real time. Um, every 30 seconds, the inventory of rapid tests and masks and so on in all the thousands of pharmacies so that people in G0V or Gov0 uh, community can take those real-time numbers and make hundreds and hundreds of different tools, maps, chatbots, voice assistants to guide people to the place where there's still masks and PPEs or rapid tests available. And more importantly, this allowed the data bias to be discovered very quickly because everyone has real-time visibility into the distribution, the opposition party and the journalists and so on. Of course, they can offer their criticism, but because they see exactly the data as we do, we can then say, please teach us. And then they make better suggestions and then we implement better distribution mechanisms again in 24 hours time. So that means that we not only increase the bandwidth of democracy, but also shorten the latency, the time it takes from one good idea, one good innovation to happen to the countrywide adoption in just 24 hours. And finally, to counter against not just the health, but mental health hazard, we rely on this idea of humor over rumor. The uh, Central Epidemic Command Center have this spoke stock named Song Chai, a Shiba Inu. Whenever we see <coughs> something inaccurate, for example, about masks containing 5G antenna or whatever, uh, we wrote out even more funny memes uh, featuring this dog. So this is about physical distancing, uh, and this is about the dog putting their hands to the mouth saying, um, wear a mask to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands. And because humor travels even more fast than conspiracy theories, uh, this allowed the science and clarifications to get to people, and people after they laugh about it will no longer uh, share the conspiracy theories. Now, uh, how do we know which conspiracy theories, which in, um, fa in, in factual ideas are being uh, going viral. Well, we again rely on something like contact tracing. So even in end-to-end -end encrypted systems like um, Messenger or Signal or uh, in Taiwan it's called Line, people can voluntarily flag incoming messages as spam. 
Uh, and just like flagging your incoming uh, email as spam, this sends this kind of fingerprint of the individual message. So we know exactly which uh, viral payloads are uh, trending. And then the fact checkers, the independent journalists, investigative journalists, uh, spend their time on only the ones that are going viral. And then the administration rolls out, again, humor over rumor uh, memes to out meme uh, the most viral uh, strains of disinformation. So this is pre-pandemic. Um, we see a viral strain that says um, $1 million fine for people who perm their hair multiple times a week. And the meme that rolls out just four hours afterward says it's not true and features the head of our cabinet, our premier Su Zhenchang, in his youth. Um, saying, I may be bald now that I used to have hair, I will not punish people with hair. And a fine print that says, the labeling crime is just for hair products. And then a hair blower saying, uh, with the premier as it looks now, saying, uh, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. Uh, your hairstyle might become my hairstyle. And a lot of people laughed about it and share it. And again, the disinformation um, become kind of inoculated, right? It's a, like a viral vaccine uh, that goes viral. And even for more um, interference that's more tangibly from outside of our jurisdiction, for example, um, there was leading to our 2020 January presidential election, a disinformation that says uh, the Hong Kong people are not really protesters, they are being hired to kill a police to earn 20 million and so on. Again, we did not take down anything, but rather we work with the social media platforms. So they carry this mandatory uh, notice and public notice, again, from the independent fact checkers. Uh, we tra traced this to the Chang'an Jian, Weibo from the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and then uh, we then say, oh, this um, message, it may be going viral, but actually the payload, this particular mutation came from the Chang'an Jian Weibo. It doesn't come from Reuters, which supplied the photo, but the original caption says something else entirely. Again, instead of taking anything down, we rely on this viral inoculation to out meme and in this time uh, inoculate against the disinformation. So to uh, quote Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, in her first inauguration speech in 2016, um, democracy of yesterday is about showdown between opposing values, but democracy nowadays must become a conversation between many diverse values. So instead of showdowns, uh, this is my office, by the way, uh, in the Social Innovation Lab, we meet with all the social innovators and we just ask two questions. How quickly can we get a rough consensus, a good enough consensus, given our different positions. And a second question, once we have the norm, the rough consensus, how quickly can we scale out the innovation so that it reaches everybody? So for example, it used to be that people um, do not trust uh, the nation's numbers about air pollution because we only had less than 100 weather stations measuring PM 2.5. But instead of just protesting, demonstrating against, people demonstrated for. So this is a demo uh, with um, primary schoolers and their teachers on their balconies and their schools setting up inexpensive PM 2.5 sensing stations, writing a distributed le ledger. It's called air boxes. And then instead of beating them, we join them. And now this uh, formed the backbone of our civil IoT system, where people can make sense of the PM 2.5 level together, where the industrial areas, industrial parks uh, are taken care of by the municipalities according to the design of the social innovators. Every year, our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, gives five trophies out of 200 or so uh, of those teams. And so after proving their concept in a smaller jurisdiction like a town or a municipality, the five winners uh, received this trophy, Shape of Taiwan, with a micro projector underneath that when you turn it on, it projects uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen giving the trophy to you, basically saying it's as good as a presidential um, idea platform, and we will strive to make the budget, the personnel, and the regulatory adjustments needed to scale that idea from one city to the entire country within the next fiscal year and that allow all sort of data collaboratives to bloom. Uh, and then we tour around Taiwan to not just introduce presidential hackathon, but also meet with the local social innovators. 
But of course, uh, there are many different stakeholders uh, for each social innovation. So we also use assistive intelligence or AI to automate this way of getting the rough consensus from the people. The first time we used it on national scale was in 2015. In 2015, when UberX first came to Taiwan, the taxi drivers, the unions, uh, and the Uber company and their passengers were feeling very differently. So we again set up a digital public infrastructure polis, uh, entirely free software, to ask people just one question. Given the common facts, how do you feel? about people riding to work, picking up strangers with a professional license, and charging them for it. Now, all those ideas that convince people of different feelings, we only hold ourselves to account to get those ideas into the agenda. So you actually have to propose something that convince people of all the four groups, who, which are grouped by their sentiments. So you see one sentiment from me, you agree, you move toward me, you disagree, you move away from me, but you have to convince all the four groups with your own sentiments in order to get it into the agenda of regulation. So uh, again, we, every time we see that the ideological debates are maybe just 5%, but it used to take all the bandwidth in mainstream media and social media. But actually, most people agree with most of each other on most of the points, most of the time. And we surface this. And then nowadays, Uber is a legal taxi company, the Q taxi, but the local churches, local temples, and so on, can also serve the ones in need in places where Uber or existing taxi fleets wouldn't go, reusing exactly the same diversified taxi regulation that we pass thanks to this crowdsourcing intelligence. So the idea of social innovation is to develop measurement of progress, the KPIs, in a way that's with the people, not just for the people. And finally, i like to relate to you my job description, which I wrote in 2016 when I first became digital minister. I used to say that uh, my work is on the three SDG targets, effective partnership, reliable data, and open innovation. But at the time, people don't memorize the SDG targets, so I translated them to poetry. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, well, let's always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening and look forward to the questions. Minister Tang. Dear Audrey, absolutely fascinating and a whole lot uh, there to digest. Who would like to pose a question to Audrey Tang? Could we have a microphone here in the front row? Thank you. Could you put your hand up again so Lova finds you? Yeah, there we go. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, now, uh, on the grounds of what you explained, your whole philosophy, and what is really done on the ground, I kept on thinking about, uh, for instance, the latest endeavor of Musk with Twitter and uh, the democratization. So if I understand well what you're doing in Taiwan, uh, it is about also controlling, having an open discussion that is controlled uh, from your ministry. And, um, and also there are also measures that of course uh, are being put in place for the good of people. Um, now, how do you see this democratization of such a jumbo platform? What can be the consequences of this, in your opinion? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a very important question of our times. People often ask me uh, when we hold town halls. Um, in Taiwan, people don't use Twitter much, so on Facebook, why do we never get the kind of good enough consensus that we consistently get from polis? And my answer is always, well, uh, I see Facebook as the digital equivalent of the entertainment sector, like a nightclub. If you, your mayor holds a town hall in the nightclub, 
it will be a smoke-filled room. Uh, you have to shout to get heard. Addictive drinks being served, maybe not suited for uh, people under 18. Uh, private bouncers waiting to escort you out, uh, and so on. And so all these is not conductive uh, to a town hall discussion. But it's not a function of the people. It's a function of the place. The place, the space was set up by the advertisers and shareholders to maximize addiction and so-called engagement. So I think the point here, like the police platform, why we took out the reply button uh, and allow people to focus on each other's sentiments, reflecting on that instead of flame wars and so on, is that because we optimize for a different kind of engagement. It's not about engagement to spend time there, but about engagement to find the common grounds despite the different positions. So it all depends on what you're optimizing for. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against the entertainment sector. I'm just saying that we should also have public parks and town halls and universities and museums in the digital place. Thank you very much. Very interesting indeed. Take out the reply button to get people to listen and not simply to talk. Here we have a question in the back. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Stephanie Babka. I'm a data culture lead at Merck. And um, yeah, I work uh, also on the topic of um, people and technology. That's why I really loved your last chart. And uh, most of the things you had on there uh, really yeah, triggered some imagination for me. So internet of beings, shared reality, human experience, but the collaborative learning and the machine learning and then uh, integrating people to it. That I didn't really see the vision you have. So I wanted to ask what, what this is about. Certainly. For me, AI stands for assistive intelligence, meaning that it's a assistive technology. Now, I happen to have an assistive technology with me, which is this eyeglass, uh, and I wear it to, to see you more clearly, but it's aligned to my values, meaning that uh, I see you instead of a 20-minute pop-up advertisement that I have to uh, wait for 20 seconds to close, right? Which would be serving somebody else's best interest, so it's aligned. Again, uh, it's accountable, meaning that if there's something blur, if there's bias and so on, I don't have to sign an NDA. I don't have to pay $3 million in uh, a license fee or something. I can't fix it myself or take it to the local civic tech people, well, the repair people uh, down the street uh, to repair this eyeglass. So if something that is at once aligned and accountable, then it enables this kind of collaborative learning that we can then empower the people closest to the pain. The end users should have the most freedom to innovate based on whatever the actual local need they have uh, from the assistive intelligence. Any AI regime that doesn't do that would be, in my book, authoritarian intelligence. I hope that answers your question. All those AIs, thank you very much. Who else has a question? Please. Uh, good morning, I'm Bertrand de la Chapelle. I'm the Chief Vision Officer of the Data Sphere Initiative. Just one question, you mentioned enhancing and facilitating data collaboratives. Can you give more examples of things that you've done in Taiwan in that regard? Yeah, definitely. So um, one thing about data collaborative is that it must uh, serve a common purpose. And I believe uh, that in um, EU, uh, it's now called uh, data altruism, if I'm not mistaken. So serving something that uh, is um, a beneficial to the general public instead of just uh, the private interest of the participants in a way that doesn't encroach on the privacy. So one example is this contact tracing system uh, that we've run for a, around one year uh, until that we fought off all the alpha and delta and the first wave of Omicron until the Paxlovid arrived to Taiwan. We use this uh, contact tracing system, which is a data collaborative, uh, to shorten the time it takes to contact trace from 24 hours to 24 minutes. It works like this. Uh, on 7-Eleven or really any venue, millions and millions of venues, they self-service and print this random QR code. And you scan it with your built-in phone, no app required. It triggers a SMS that sends these 15 random digits to 1922, the toll-free uh, number for counter-epidemic that I just mentioned. And so what this does is that it stores in your local telecom, we have five telecoms, whatever telecom you have, it stores this post-it note there for 28 days. And if this venue has an outbreak, 
then uh, the venue learns nothing about you. The venue doesn't even know your phone number. And the telecom, because it's a random code, doesn't know which venue you've been to. But these two pieces puzzled together allows the contact tracing people to send an automated notification to you. So this bootstraps much more easy than Bluetooth-based exposure notification because it requires no Bluetooth. Even a flip phone, you can manually tweet uh, those 15 digits into 1922. Of course, we provide reverse accountability. So on this website, you can authenticate using your phone and you can download in reverse audit in the past four weeks which contact tracing in which municipality, out of which reason, have looked at your checking code. Of course, everything is deleted permanently after 28 days. And so through, I think the technical term is an oblivious federated storage. People join this uh, voluntarily, uh, and people who don't want to use it, of course, can always revert back to pen and paper. Fascinating. Thank you very much. So I have another question here in the third row. Tatiana Rumeau, um, France. Um, I have a question. If you would replicate your progress and success in Europe, let's say in France, in Germany, what would you your what would, would be the main obstacles? <laughs> um, the main ground on which we stand is a resilient infrastructure that offers broadband as a human right. Indeed, anywhere in Taiwan, even tip of Taiwan, the Yushan or Jade Mountain, uh, almost 4,000 meters high, you're guaranteed to have um, some 10 megabits per second, and both ways also uh, allowing for this kind of data collaboratives to form. Now, if you don't, it's my fault, like personally, my fault. I've got people in quarantine place sending me emails uh, complaining <laughs> that uh, they're suffering from a human right violation. And uh, within two weeks, we set up a repeater tower to solve that. By that time, they're already out of isolation, but they made a point of driving back to measure the speed test and uh, posting on social media to hold me to account. So that's the first thing, broadband as a human right. And the second thing is the data and media competence in basic and lifelong education instead of the literacy curriculum which you used to have in the days of televisions and radio broadcasting where people do not get to be producers. Nowadays, as you have seen on the Airbox example, everyone who wants to learn about data stewardship and so on can actually contribute to the data. So for the um, primary schooler who measure the weather um, and for the middle schoolers who fact check the three presidential candidates on the presidential debate platform and got uh, their fact check uh, posted on national uh, live streaming TV and so on, they get empowered even before they turn 18. So I think the digital competence and broadband as human right will be the two pillars on which these ideas stand. Thanks very much for that. Who else has one final question for Audrey Tang? No further questions? Okay, then. Dear Minister Tang, what a, what a fantastic look you've given us at your uh, achievements in Taiwan. I think there's a great deal for all of us to learn from what you've shared with us. And we're very grateful that you could join us. Thank all you. the best for you. Thank you. Live long and prosper. <laughs>